as you can imagine, the internet is an extremely complex thing. After all, it is many computers interconnected to each other, you know, worldwide. And what this means is, in order for things to actually run smoothly, to run in a predictable manner, we'll need a strict set of rules governing what each device does and how they actually communicate with each other. One of the strategies that have been implemented to do this is what is known as the OSI model. And that's what we're going to look at today. The OSI model basically breaks down how devices should communicate to each other into seven levels of abstraction. And yeah, by looking at things that way, we get a clearer picture of what everything is supposed to do. If you are computer science students, you will actually encounter the OSI model pretty early on in your uni life. And you'll find that even though, you know, the big picture is extremely easy to understand, well, it actually branches into many deeper, more complex places. Today, we're going to try and get that big picture right, so that when you actually encounter this in your school life, well, you'll be able to, you know, sort of get your foundation right very quickly and go and find out the difficult things as you need to. You're watching another Random Wednesday episode on 0612 TV. Hello and welcome back to another Random Wednesday episode. Now, here's the deal. If you have multiple devices connected together in a network, there are different ways in which you can actually describe how they communicate with each other. For example, if you want to go to a low level, well, you can talk of things in terms of bits on the wire. If you want to go to a higher level, you could talk about, you know, the actual messages that are transmitted from a program to another program. However, ultimately, at the end of the day, we are basically looking at the same thing at different levels of abstraction. And that is exactly what the OSI model is trying to do. OSI stands for Open Systems Interconnection, and basically its model is broken up into seven layers. These layers are your seven levels of abstraction and serves to basically describe all the communications between any two devices. What we're going to do today is we're going to look at all these layers from the bottom up and try to understand what each layer is for. First up is the physical layer. Now, this layer is all about bits on a wire. It doesn't even care about what devices are actually connected at the ends of the wire. We're not even interested in the message that is being passed. What we care about is just, you know, which devices are connected to each other. And we might want to know something about the mode of communications they're using as well. For this, there are three different ways, simplex, half duplex, and full duplex. And really, what these terms refer to is just the direction of flow of information. Every single connected device operates on a physical layer, you know, for the very simple reason that you are going to have to physically transmit some information from one point to another for anything to work. And many of the standards that are extremely common today, you know, things like Ethernet, like Wi-Fi, like Bluetooth, they all actually define certain things about the physical layer. So in order to make use of these communication standards, your physical layer must conform to whatever they demand for. The next layer up is the data link layer, which describes how two devices are actually linked to each other. So we're moving a little bit up from the physical layer. Now we're concerned about, you know, how devices actually discover each other, how they start a conversation and sort of, you know, get the information flowing between these two devices. This is used by protocols like MAC, also known as Media Access Control. Now, you may have heard of a MAC address, and this is actually the physical address associated to individual pieces of hardware. This is a unique identifier and cannot be changed. And in fact, at layer 2, that is how information is actually passed from one device to another. Messages can only go from one physical address to another, if we're talking about communications on this layer. Now, some implementations of layer 2 communications even include some kind of a checksum for error correction. This is optional, of course, depending on implementation, but yeah, it does exist. Let's move one layer up again to layer 3, the network layer. Now, on this layer, we introduce a new concept of routing. Every device on a network now gets a logical address. When you want to actually you know, pass a packet to a particular address, 
you can actually pass it to a middleman who will relay it to that final address. This is known as routing, and one very notable example of a protocol that does this is IP. You probably have heard of IP, after all this is how you know much of the internet actually works, and well same goes for actually setting up your home networks. Moving up once again, our next layer is the transport layer, which allow messages to actually move either within a network or between networks. Examples of protocols on this layer include TCP and UDP. Now, TCP should be quite familiar to you because once again, it is what powers the internet. A sophisticated protocol like TCP actually adds a lot of features, which are kinda optional on this particular layer. Much of the enhancements added by TCP actually serve to increase the reliability of the communication channel. For example, instead of expressing communications as just little packets moving back and forth, we now picture it as a channel. This makes things more consistent, you don't have to think about you know, having to identify yourself every time, for example. And of course, additional advantages include the fact that if you are actually communicating on a noisy network, Packets that are lost are automatically resent. Information is guaranteed to arrive at the correct order, which is something that you normally cannot guarantee, you know, because the internet can sort of speed up and slow down different packets. And TCP also has features to actually combat network congestion. Such features are not available in its counterpart UDP, which sort of just leaves you on your own. If packets are lost, that's too bad. If packets arrive in the wrong order, you're gonna have to implement your own stuff to rearrange it back. So yeah, once again, this shows you that, you know, protocols existing on the same layer don't always have to do the same amount of stuff. <sighs> Moving on once again to layer number five, this is the session layer. Now, the concept behind a session is extremely simple. It is simply, you know, the question of how do we string together multiple sentences to form a conversation. Simply put, there needs to be some notion of state. You need to sort of keep track of how the conversation has gone so far, so that you know how the next sentence fits in. A protocol that implements this is HTTP. Again, HTTP is what powers the internet, so you probably should recognize it. And we can see this in action when browsing you know, any web page. For example, when you're logged in on one website, and you browse to another page on the same website, well, you're still logged in. That is evidence of some states being retained, and that is essentially what a session is. Next up is layer 6, the presentation layer. This is when data that's actually received over the network gets converted into something meaningful. This can actually refer to quite a wide range of operations, you know, things like encryption and decryption, as well as encoding and decoding into text and images. When we say we want to turn the information into something meaningful, it could be meaningful for the user, you know, for the user to actually consume, or meaningful for another program to actually process. And finally, right at the very top, layer number 7, the application layer. Simply put, that is the application in which the user is using to communicate on the network. Of course, the role of this particular layer varies from program to program, but the idea is, it of course needs to allow the user to both send and receive things from the network. And there you go, those were the 7 layers of the OSI model. Now, there are a few things I'd like you to take note of. Firstly, as you may have noticed, certain responsibilities can actually exist at different layers. For example, we mentioned earlier that, you know, as low as layer 2, we could already have error checking with checksums. And yet, certain protocols at layer 4 could also do the same thing. What this means of course is that, you know, operations aren't always limited to a particular layer, the same kind of operation can exist at different layers, and perhaps their roles are slightly different even though the end result is similar. Since the nature of the data changes subtly as we move from one layer to another, an operation at a higher level may not be exactly the same as an operation at the lower level. One example of this is encryption. If we were to encrypt our stuff at, say, the application layer, then information that is actually injected at the lower layers will not actually be encrypted. Conversely, if we were to actually encrypt our things very low down, very near to the physical layer, then more things get obfuscated. Another thing to note is, not all devices actually operate on all layers. Now, for something more complex like, say, a computer or a smartphone, 
Well, you would expect it to actually run on all layers because of course it needs to do things on all of them. But for something simpler like say a router, well, it may only exist at some of the lower layers. Since we don't actually expect a router to be doing things like, you know, session, presentation or application. But yeah, basically that's it. That's your OSI model. That's all there is for this particular episode. I hope you've learned something today. But until next time, you're watching 0612TV. Thank you very much for watching. If you liked this video, consider checking out the rest of my work on my channel. Alternatively, you may be interested in a playlist of my earlier work on computing and computer science topics. If you'd like to show me some monetary support, I am on Patreon. You can find a link to my campaign in the video description. Of course, you can simply like this video or leave a comment. I'll be sure to respond as soon as I can. To keep in touch with my future uploads, do subscribe to this channel. And for even more updates, check out the official Twitter account for this channel at 0612TV. Thank you for your support.